Hello and welcome to the 21st installment of my Pokemon Generation 3 ROM hacking series. The focus of this tutorial is to show off some scripting tips and to address whatever mistakes I've made that I didn't go over in my last advice and errata video. This video will be broken down into the following segments. What are some extra commands that I should know about? What are some helpful scripting strategies for making complex events? And what mistakes have you made that I should be aware of? There will not be an application demonstration after the bulk of this tutorial. This video is meant to serve as a wrap-up video to the past six tutorials, all dealing with scripting. If you've ever scrolled through XSE's built-in command helper, you might have noticed that there's a sizable list of buffer commands. I'm not going to go over what every single one of them does. The reason for this is because that all of these commands work in the same way with very particular differences, which are spelled out for you in the names of the commands. Before we can talk about these, we need to cover the escape character slash v. Slash v can be used when we want to display some text that is already stored for reference somewhere in the ROM. More specifically, slash v calls a certain variable so we can use whatever is stored inside of it. For example, the player's name consists of a string of text that is chosen and referred back to throughout the game. If we want to refer to this stored text in a script, we could write slash v slash h01. The slash v tells the script that we're going to be referring to some already stored text inside of a variable. The additional slash h tells the script which variable we're going to be referring to. The variable 0x01 represents the player's name if it is used after the slash v escape character. Another variable we can use is 0x06, which displays the rival's name. Now let's jump back into buffer commands. We'll start with buffer Pokemon. This command will store the specified Pokémon's name into a variable, which we can refer to later using the slash v escape character. Buffer Pokémon has two parameters, the first being the variable number to assign the Pokémon's name to, and the second being the Pokémon's hex value. There's a twist to the first parameter, however. Let's say we want to assign the name Bulbasaur to the variable 0x03. To do this, we need to subtract 2 from the variable number 0x03. Therefore, we would use the value 0x01 instead of 0x03. You must subtract 2 from your variable numbers or else you'll be assigning stuff to the wrong variables. After that, we'll reference the name Bulbasaur in a message box command using slash v slash h03. You might recall that whenever I've displayed stored names in the past, I always use a word like player or rival in between two square brackets, as demonstrated on screen. These brackets are another way of referring to stuff stored inside of variables, and you can use them instead of the slash v escape character if you'd like. We've been on buffers for a while, but we're not quite done. You might be thinking that this whole stored a variable nonsense is rather stupid and useless, since we could just type out the name of whatever we're storing in plain dialogue instead. This is where buffers actually see a very interesting use. Let's discuss the command buffer first Pokemon. This command will store the name of the first Pokémon in the player's party to the specified variable. In this case, I've assigned it to the variable 0x04, but I use 0x02 in the command since we have to subtract 2 from the variable number as already mentioned. This kind of thing is what buffers are great for, that is, storing information that isn't otherwise static into variables for later reference. By static, I mean information that's written in stone from the moment the game is launched. For example, the first Pokémon in the player's party is not static. It's always changing and is only temporary. In order to figure out what Pokémon this is, you'll have to store it in a buffer and reference it in dialog at a later point. We're not going to go over the rest of the buffer commands since they all work in a similar fashion. The next command I don't want to talk about is NOP or any variation of it. This command does nothing. You might see it when decompiling scripts, so I just wanted to mention it here quickly. Compare vars takes two parameters, both being variable numbers. This command will check if they store the same value. If so, last result restores 0x1. If not, last result stores 0x0. Call ASM is a very important command, but we haven't come across any uses for it yet. You might have heard of ASM routines that some hackers insert into their games to simulate custom, unique events or functionalities not normally possible with the vanilla ROM. We'll get to this command once we begin inserting ASM routines into our game, but I can't say when that will be. Get player pose retrieves the X and Y position of the player on the map, then stores them in the variables specified. 
This command takes two parameters, those being the two variables to store the x and y coordinates, respectively. The command set catch location will change the specified party member's catch location. If you don't know what this means, I'll highlight on screen the text that set catch location manipulates. It has two parameters, those being the slot of the Pokemon in the player's party and the desired catch location, respectively. Changing the location to Mount Moon, for instance, would result in this happening. I'll post the list of valid catch location hex values in the description of this video. The final three commands I'm going to cover in this series deal with the overworld animations. Do animation, set animation, and check animation. These commands deal with animations that may be seen while the player is walking around in the overworld, such as the animation that plays after using Cut on tall grass, after using Sweet Scent to attract wild Pokémon, or after using Fly to descend or ascend a character into or out of the air. Set Animation will tell the game which Pokémon in the player's party to use when showing an animation on screen, if applicable. It takes two parameters, those being the animation value and the party slot, respectively. Do Animation will actually play the specified animation. It takes one parameter, which is the animation value. Check Animation will check if the animation is currently being played. If so, it will halt script execution until the animation is finished. It takes one parameter, which is the animation to check for. That's every single command I'm going to cover in this series. There are a few that I didn't cover, but those are hardly ever used or virtually useless in their functionality. You should now be able to make some great comprehensive scripts for your ROM hack by utilizing each command we've talked about. Let's move on to some helpful scripting strategies or implementation details for making complicated events easier. The first tip deals with trainer battles. When I went over trainer battles, I mostly talked about the Type 0x0 and Type 0x1, since they're the most frequently used. If you took the time to read through the chart shown on screen, you might have noticed that Type 0x9 functions as Fire Red's tutorial battle with your rival in Professor Oak's laboratory. If the player loses this battle, he or she will not be sent back to the last visited respawn point. The script will just continue as usual. Lots of hackers ask questions about how to make a trainer battle which the player is supposed to lose due to the game's plot. I often see people answering, saying trainer battle 0x9 is the only option, which is almost never satisfying since if you use it, Professor Oak's dialogue will show up whenever the player or the rival makes a move. So how can we get the script to continue if the player loses? I've placed five new NPCs in front of a house in Viridian City. The three Team Rocket Grunts and Giovanni all have the flag of 0x200 assigned to them. I place the fifth NPC, a policeman, one tile above the door to the house, for the same reason that I talked about in my last Advice in Arata video. The policeman has a flag of 0x201 assigned to him. This whole event will play out like so. First, the player will speak to Giovanni. A battle between the two will then commence. Giovanni's Pokémon will be much too high for the players to handle, thus the battle will end with the player being defeated. After the player walks back to where the Team Rocket characters were standing, they'll all be gone and the policeman will be standing there instead. This simulates a story progression even in the event that the player loses a battle. To start, we need to hide the policeman sprite so he's not shown when the player fights Giovanni. We're going to craft a Type 03 level script to take care of all of the hiding and showing business. Let's start by checking if the flag 0x200 has been set. If it has, then Giovanni has already disappeared from Viridian City since he has the flag 0x200 assigned to him. Before we mess with the at already battled pointer section, let's finish the at start section. If the flag 0x200 has not yet been set, then the policeman should not be shown on the map, so we need to set his flag. That's all we need for that section. The at already battled section will be triggered if the player has already battled and lost to Giovanni. As soon as the player returns to the map, Team Rocket should be gone and the policeman should appear in front of the house. Upon reaching this point in the script, Team Rocket will already be gone since their flag needed to be set in order to get there. This leaves us with displaying the policeman in front of the house. To do this, we first need to clear his flag. Next, we need to move him two tiles down from where he's initially standing. We can use the move sprite 2 command for this. That's all for the level script. Now we need to write the actual person event that triggers when the player speaks to Giovanni. I've already written the trainer battle command with intro text. Obviously, the at player wins pointer will never be reached since the player will not win this battle. 
You'll also notice that I've set the flag 0x200 before commencing the fight. I did this so that the game knows for future reference that the player has already attempted to fight Giovanni. Since the player is going to lose, Giovanni's trainer flag of 0x001 will not be set after the battle. This is why we have to utilize an additional flag to check if the player has at least attempted a battle with him. The last thing we need to do is write a simple dialogue script for the policeman NPC. This will trigger after the player returns to the map and interacts with him. Viewing the result, we can see that the policeman is initially hidden since Team Rocket is present. Speaking to Giovanni commences a trainer battle, but just before the trainer battle begins, flag 0x200 is set. The setting of this flag is what causes Team Rocket to disappear after reloading the map after losing the battle. After losing to Giovanni, the player is sent back to the Poke Center to heal. Returning to the house, the player finds that not only has Team Rocket vanished, succeeding in their evil plans, but a policeman has also appeared, explaining to the player what has recently happened. Of course, if you wanted the policeman to disappear after talking to him, you'll have to incorporate that in a Type 03 level script. It would take some thinking, but it's certainly doable. That's the only tip I could think of to share with you all. There's also only one past mistake, if you can even call it that, that I feel like I should clear up. Back in my Trainer Battle Dissection video, I showed off Advanced Trainer and its various properties. I've gotten a message or two saying that one or two of my explanations were a bit off. I'm not going to mention which properties those were, since even if I did talk about them, it wouldn't actually change anything. You would still fill the box out exactly how I initially told you to, so nothing would change. However, I do feel it's fair to bring up the fact that sometimes I don't use the most up-to-date software for ROM hacking. It's not a huge deal though, especially at this point in the series. The only reason why I might want to download some of the more recent software is to assure compatibility with more recent discoveries, like displaying an expanded Pokedex, for example. Needless to say, everything I show you in the series is 100% okay to use, and if there's ever a deviation from the norm to accommodate for a video's topic, I'll make sure to let you know about whatever new software I decide to use. On another note, there were a few hex value lists or other values that weren't specified for Emerald and Ruby hackers. If any of those values are published in the future, please let me know so I can add them to the description of the respective tutorial. I like to keep things nice and robust so that people can come to this series much further into the future and get what they're looking for. That's everything I wanted to cover in this tutorial. Hopefully you all learned something valuable from this, and if you have any questions, please feel free to ask either over at Poke Community or right here in my video's comments section. Thank you so much for being my audience, and I'll be back in the 22nd installment of this series.